to see everybody. I'm Meg Riley here in sunny and beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, which I can't complain a bit about because that's not how it's been lately. Michael Tino, where are you? Good morning, everyone. I'm here in Peekskill, New York, where uh, it's cloudy but bright, so I'm not complaining either. It's, it's a beautiful fall day here in the Hudson Valley. That's great. Our other two regular hosts, Christina Rivera and Asia Hauser, are at Lareda, the Liberal Religious Educators Association in Houston today. So I'm delighted that we have a couple of guest hosts. We have Dawn Fortune. Hey, Dawn. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm a little scattered. I just skated in. Um, it's been a, a busy week of, of memorial services here. So um, where's but, here? Uh, here is um, South Jersey. I serve the UU congregation of the South Jersey Shore in Galloway, New Jersey. A um, little congregation, about 100 people. And um, yeah, we had one of our pillars of the community die this week. So I'm so sorry. We've got a lot going on. Yeah, sorry about that. Thanks. And we also have Jalen Scott uh, as a guest host this morning. Good morning, Jalen. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I am in Edmonds uh, in Washington, and it is dark, and it may stay dark for the rest of the day and maybe a few months. So <laughs> good to see everyone here. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, and maybe for the rest of my life. <laughs> so well, a few man, months, you know. Little <laughs> Seattle, yes, the rest of my life, as long as I live here. <laughs> And we have on tech, Jessica Star Rockers. Jessica, what can you tell us about what you're up to today? Well, I am on Facebook Live and um, following any questions or comments that, you, that folks who are watching put in the chat there, and I will pass those on to our guests and our hosts. I'm also on Twitter, hashtag The View, where I'm going to write in anything that appeals and is interesting to me. <laughs> and um, I'm uh, also in the Seattle area and it is also dark and, um, you know, it's, a, it's not that bad, I will say. I like the darkness. It is, um, it is fun to enter it, but um, it stays, I think, a bit long, so. And um, yes. I think it. we're about at the same, same latitude of darkness here, yeah. We're just in a different time zone, that's all. <laughs> well, I'm excited to say that we have two special guests with us this morning. Alex Capitan, um, who is out there in Massachusetts on the steering committee of trust, uh, transgender you use to, I don't know what the T is. Transgender religious professional you use together. Together. It's not quite an acronym <laughs> that hangs together, but <laughs> okay. you know, you make it all work. Right. <laughs> That's great. And co-leader of the Transforming Hearts Collective. And Chris McElroy, who's a community volunteer and advocate, calling us as Chris returns from vacation. So wonderful to have you two. And we're going to spend the hour talking about how we can care for transgender folks in this time. Uh, Jalen Scott, who's been a guest before, is uh, now here again as a community minister and consultant. And Don Fortune is mentioned as a congregational minister. So we have lots of perspectives. Before we start on that, I did wanna share, it's election week. Many of us are facing uh, some pretty frightening elections where we are, many of them directly related to the topic of this morning's uh, conversation and the communities affected. Here in Minnesota where I live, we have a really terrifying candidate for attorney general who is vowing to implement um, the president's agenda in Minnesota which Minnesota, which is seen as a populous state is very divided between cities and rural as pretty much everywhere is now. And um, so I, in my little how to do this, I've been doing phone banking and door knocking and stuff, but I decided to write a personal letter to all my neighbors. So I wrote that and delivered 45 of them around my neighborhood this morning and realized 45 didn't go as far as I thought, so I'm gonna do 50 more tomorrow. But I figured if even one person, and I, the people who like the agenda, they're gonna vote for this guy, but the people who are gonna vote third party or maybe not vote at all, maybe I could persuade two or three of them to vote. And, and so I said, I'm Meg Riley, here's my address, I'm a lesbian. Um, and it was a little, and I said, and that's a scary thing to tell you all, but it's even scarier to think of this guy as attorney general who's declared war on many communities. 
Um, so we'll see. But anyway, I just want to plug uh, personal outreach to bankers, to people at cafes we frequent, to all the people we know and know a little bit who might or might not decide to vote. Uh, because as we can see from what's going on right now, we might not love any of the candidates, but really some of them really hate us. So, <laughs> so let's try to keep them out of office. Um, so I just wanted to do that little plug. Anything else, anyone with elections in your area? I know Alex, you all in Massachusetts are facing an ugly ballot initiative. Yeah, unfortunately, Massachusetts is, uh, has a ballot initiative, which is the first of its kind. It's a ballot initiative to remove trans protections from our anti-discrimination law in Massachusetts, which was so hard fought and so hard won. Um, so for the first time ever in this country, voters have the opportunity to say, no, trans people don't get to have rights and life and liberty um, in this particular way. So it's, it's also very scary. Um, and we're, there's a really good campaign to fight it. And a lot of Unitarian Universalists have gotten involved. Thank you if you're one of them listening. Um, it's not too late. We really need all the help we can get. So if you in your state have anything like this going on, please help us pull out all the stops to make this not happen <laughs> and keep folks you know, safe as much as we can legislatively. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I'm, I'm also the parent of a 22 year old trans kid who lives in Massachusetts, who is as a young adult facing this ballot initiative on their life, which is just a, something that should never happen to any human being. Michael. And even here in, in liberal New York, um, things hang in the balance in this election. Uh, are, are the, the balance of power in our state Senate in particular. And one of the things that uh, the Republicans who've controlled the state Senate have uh, prevented from happening is the passage of the Gender Non-Discrimination Act, Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act in New York. So New York has no no legal protections for transgender or gender non-conforming or gender non-binary people in our law. And if one seat flips in the state Senate, uh, we will actually get that law passed. So <laughs> it, even, even here in liberal New York, there's a lot on the line. Um, and the harm reduction that's done is actually reducing very, very real harm uh, to people. Yeah, when people talk about the lesser of two evils, I'm like, less evil is less evil. Let's go for it. You know, <laughs> like, let's harm as few people as possible, even if, you know, I, I don't think that people who want to run empires generally are going to be my friends, but I can, some of them can be sworn enemies and some of them are at least trying. And there are some fabulous people running for office. We should also name that. Here in Minnesota, there are just a record number of of gender queer and queer folk and people of color and just some really, really exciting uh, races going on that I, that I just feel great about working with. And so let's celebrate that as well. So, well, let's talk about, and you know, let's be real, this, this latest federal assault was in no mass way a get out the vote uh, work for uh, the conservative fundamentalist Christian voters uh, who might have been getting disgusted by this administration for how immoral it is on other issues. So, um, you know, so we had this horrific announcement uh, two weeks ago from the federal government. Uh, allegedly, they're just considering this, but um, just kind of declaring uh, some people don't exist, basically. Um, so I I'm curious about the responses that people have seen where you are to this and, um, and who, who you see is coming forward. And Alex, maybe let's start with you because I know that you mentioned congregations that have been involved there in Massachusetts. Have you seen um, effective response from Unitarian Universalists to this latest assault? Um, before I answer that question, I just wanna also lift up the all of the other trauma that we're all holding from this past week the fact that we're dealing with yet another mass massacre really it's not a mass anything it's a massacre in a synagogue and also a shooting in a kroger um uh, supermarket after the gunman was turned away from a black church 
um, that left two people dead and and more, right? A school shooting. There's There's been so much going on in the last week. Um, and for folks who live at any of the intersections of those realities, it, you know, added to the the latest attack on, you know, birthright citizenship that we also experienced within the last week. I mean, it's just that massive, right? And that Thank heavy. you for naming it. You know, it just gets so deep. It, it's hard to even, yeah. oh yeah, and then there were the pipe bombs. Yeah, it's just- Right, yeah. and then there were that, right? It's just, it just keeps going and going. And this is not to slight you for not naming it. It just really feels like when we start talking about who is most impacted by the events of the last week, that's really important to hold that you know, my own personal uh, hearts and, and prayers and feelings are with my Jewish trans friends and, you know, my friends who, uh, who do, you know, benefit from birthright citizenship, who are also trans and also Jewish, um, or, you know, who are in school and are now scared of that, or, or who go shopping and are Black, right? So all of this um, just feels really heavy. And for, for every bit that I might be feeling attacked and vulnerable and scared and hurting. I know that folks who are affected by multiples of these events just in the last week, um, that feeling is compounded. So just to bring that forward and, and just to tell everyone who's listening, if, if this is you, we are all loving on you right now and sending you so much energy. Um, and our faith is, uh, is with you um, because you are us. Um, so that just feels really important. Um, and, uh, and I have to say my attentions in the last week have been, um, with, with queer and trans folk, um, and other folks who live at the intersections of all of this awfulness and trauma. Um, I, I have been, you know, paying attention to how to care for our people and, and what we need and, um, and, and working within trust in particular, our trans uh, religious professionals group within this denomination to, to pull together, what are we seeing? What are we feeling? What are the needs among our people? And how can we help the, the movement at large um, meet those needs? So I, I haven't actually seen that much response from the movement at large, um, but that's probably because I've been very focused on uh, that particular segment. Thanks. Jalen, you, you uh, came and did a wonderful show about the faith development of trans folks and caring for trans folks. What, um, I, I mean, you're here as a host, but I wanna ask you also uh, from your, your perspective, what, um, what you've seen and what you suggest for people who are affected. Yeah, I think I was going to, my next question was gonna be um, sort of to Alex and Chris. I think I don't have answers in this moment. Um, it's, it's a tricky place to be uh, doing ministry when you feel that you are a target, right? And um, when you're feeling vulnerable. So I, maybe a conversation um, with Alex and Chris and, and everyone here about how the different ways that we're taking care of each other. So maybe we can get some ideas about this. For me, it's been entering a space of contemplation. Um, I mean, it, from the sort of negative side, it would look like isolation, but um, I'm gonna call it oppositionally in contemplation where I can step into my own space of safety and um, just regroup and figure out, you know, um, where my situational awareness needs to be when I step out and what is actually safe for me to engage in or not to engage in, but really taking that moment just to step back and to close the door in my bedroom and to enter the space of prayer. Um, but I am curious about how everyone is taking care of each other in this moment and themselves. Chris, do you have a response to that? Um, I've actually um, have been doing the same thing, um, being at the intersecting points of many different identities that are being targeted and have been targeted. The self-care aspect um, has become very important to me over the last couple of weeks, um, but it's interesting because I've also 
have been speaking up about that self-care aspect when out in the community. How important it is to actually hear and ask people who identify as trans or any of the identities that are being targeted, actually asking them what they need um, instead of taking a general standpoint. Um, because each person needs something different and that it's also okay to not know what you might need because I know yesterday I didn't know what I needed um, and I needed that space for that to be okay too. Um, it's a very scary time. It's been scary for quite a while um, and for me, it seems to keep getting more scary, not less scary. Um, and I, the only response I have seen for me where I'm at in Maryland has been the blanket statement of a um, of prayer and a general statement of support without any actual one-on-one um, -on -one conversation. So that has led me to needing more self-care um, to cope with support being a blanket, generalized support, instead of me feeling like an actual person that's being targeted, which can happen when support is done on a general basis, as in on a Sunday morning when sitting in a UU congregation, it's I'm being addressed, but as an individual person, I'm not being addressed. Um, and that's added a component to having to need to engage in more self-care to cope with that aspect too and figure out how to navigate all of these different dynamics during a scary time. So, yeah. Thank you. Don, were you gesturing or? No, okay. Yeah, I, I think what you say is so, critical, Chris, is how human body, vulnerable human bodies receive this individually as well as collectively, and that collective responses are inadequate to address that personal, as I mentioned, I'm the parent of a trans kid. And so I thought some other parents might reach out to me to say they were sorry for what, not a single friend of mine said a word to me. Many of them were posting memes or saying general things, not a single person. And it took me about four days to start crying. I went from just numb to like, wait a minute, what is wrong with my friends here, you know, who, who don't have trans kids, but who, who have, who aren't the, I'm not talking about, I didn't expect the trans community. They, needed to be reaching out to one another. But I, I thought some people kind of at my tier of, and nobody, and I, it, that made me realize so much, you know, when the synagogue bombing happened, I, I mean, the shooting, I, I reached out individually, I made cookies. I, I mean, I just thought we have to have, we have to keep this human, this cannot become about the news. The, and that's the prayer I did in the church I serve. I said, we, when we allow this to become news stories, we are part of the problem. These, these are human, vulnerable neighbors of ours who are sitting here in this community. And, um, but I, I have to say, my friends, when I would see them and say, you know, I'm really upset you didn't call me, they would be like, oh my God, I'm so, I didn't want to add to your burden, they would say. And I was like, you think that I wasn't thinking about this if you didn't, it's sort of like when people die and other people don't want to talk to them about a death, you know, cause they don't quite know what to say. And I feel like, and it's the letter that I wrote to CLF for the newsletter this week. Like it's going to feel awkward and you're going to feel vulnerable. Good. 
good. That vulnerability will make other people feel more connected to you. Your awkwardness will be a gift um, and not a gift of, I know that you're not asking for a lot of cisgender people to start kind of mauling you <laughs> with, oh, I feel terrible. What should I do? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, but care and, and understanding that this is people that we love versus mega. I, I just, Chris, I just heard that so clearly what you just said and, and Jay Lynn and um, it's so, it's so important and powerful. This is Alex and for those who are listening instead of watching. <laughs> and uh, just to add to that, I think I'm super grateful for what you said, Jalen, because I feel like that encapsulated so much around, you know, what so much of the work um, that we do in the Transforming Hearts Collective is centered on healing justice and being able to sort of really think and act together on the question of what does care truly look like in this world that we're living in? What does communal care look like? How can we reimagine what self-care means in a world that has sort of um, a capitalist world that has commodified and, and appropriated the concept of self-care and made it into something like spend money, <laughs> go on a cruise, that's self-care. It's, it's individualistic, it's, it's, you know, it's consumerist. And that's, that's not how marginalized communities have ever treated um, care for self and one another. Um, you know, caring for ourselves is a radical act. It's a revolutionary act in a world in which we are not supposed to be here, according to dominant oppressive structures, in a world that's act actively trying to annihilate us as marginalized peoples. Um, so that question of care is so important. And, um, and right now as a community, when we talk about communal care, what I hear from Meg as well and Chris is, you know, what does it look like to care for one another? And what does it look like to act as if and act from a place of knowing that trans people are us, that trans people are here, that Unitarian Universalism is home to many, many trans people, right? And people who are Jewish, ethnically, culturally raised Jewish, still practice Judaism, blend Judaism with Unitarian Universalism, and people whose parents were undocumented when they were born, right? All, all the ways in which, you know, the events of this week have, have accumulated. I think one of the things that I've been talking about with other folks this week is the fact that so often in UU circles, what, what I've noticed and what, what other folks have, have observed is that when something like this happens, our our first instinct sometimes is to, to go outside of Unitarian Universalism, to give money to Trans Lifeline, for example, or Trans Law Center, which is wonderful, please do that, that's wonderful, that's really needed. But, and also thinking about those trans people out there and how can we help support those trans people out there um, as opposed to how can we support the trans people and the friends and family and loved ones of trans people in Unitarian Universalism? What does communal care look like? Um, and to Chris's point around, instead of it being a sort of, we, we are holding in our hearts, trans people and loved ones, you know, on a Sunday morning, actively making the individual connection to those people who are in the congregation and in Unitarian Universalism, because that's really different, right? That feels really different. It's a different kind of care. Um, and lastly, just to say another, one last thing on care, I was uh, talking to a, another trans person in our movement who was saying that, you know, he was actually really having a hard time with the people who were individually reaching out. So having the blessing and the privilege of having people in his life who were personally saying, oh my gosh, I'm sending you love, actually just was a, a, a bittersweet and salt in the wound kind of experience because those same people weren't there for him when he really needed their support earlier. Um, when he was, you know, having a really hard time health-wise, um, you know, in previous months and things like this. And so it was just really hard to be like, oh, you know, what is, what is the, what's the motivation behind you reaching out? Is the motivation behind you reaching out to make yourself feel less uncomfortable? Or is the motivation behind you reaching out to authentically try to be there for me and offer me care? Because I need that from you beyond just when something terrible happens, right? So it's so complex, right? And none of this is to say that anyone is, you know, 
a horrible person <laughs> for not, <laughs> you know, being better at this. Because like you said, Meg, this is awkward and this is hard. And that's what it means to actually be committed to being in relationship as a faith community, right? I think, <clears throat> I think Alex makes a good point. Um, and it is awkward and it is hard. Um, and I think <clears throat> the best example of this individual outreach that I've ever seen was in the aftermath of the Pulse shooting, the nightclub shooting. And I was in St. Louis and I happened to be um, at a coffee shop where Reverend Sekou um, also hung out and had coffee. And my partner and I were just sitting eating our brunch because it was my day off. And he was at the two tables over. And I just, he was just going through his phone and calling everybody who knew who was queer and leaving a voicemail saying, hey, I'm thinking of you. And, and that's all it takes is just somebody saying, hey, thinking of you. Um, we don't have to say we have any answers. We don't have to be able to fix it. Just sort of that, that soul touch of, you know, a finger on the heart and saying, I'm, I'm thinking of you and I'm here. And honestly, we don't need to do a whole lot more than that. I think that's what Meg's talking about, right? When, when you, people, and like you said, it's, it's like when someone dies, people get all awkward and they don't know what to say and they don't want to upset. Um, and, and you don't have to. You don't have to have the right thing to say. All you have to do is be there. You know, it's about being present. There is, um, uh, yes, Don. I think um, that 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 touch, just touching in and sending love and support. I'm very, very lucky, um, like Alex's friend, to have people who have reached out. Uh, particularly in this moment, but I'm curious about um, the sort of ongoing support that Alex is talking about, and maybe this is a a, a moment of sort of uh, blessing um, <clears throat> that we can revisit our commitment to trans and gender nonconforming folks in our community, particularly those who um, are newly and transitioning and all of the support that they need in this moment with fear that, you know, maybe the surgeries won't happen and maybe the IDs won't happen and maybe the, so what do they need in this moment to get through that? Um, also, Chris, I know you said yesterday you didn't know what you needed and it sounds like today you know what you need and I'm, I wonder what that, <laughs> what some of those things are. Um. There's still a lot that I'm not sure what I need. Um, part of it actually comes to still being in the middle of the transition, transitioning process for me, um, and having to make the decision, having to give myself space to make the decision personally, um, without feeling. Um, pressure um, to how I think I should be making the decision. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing that changed for me between yesterday and today um, was to give myself space to for it to be okay with what I need. So for me, being on church on a Sunday morning is actually for me too much right now because of um, everything that's been happening. Um, it's, I can't really, I can't sit and listen right now on a Sunday morning in a space that's crowded and having to make that, I had to make that be okay. Um, and I think that's one of the things is realizing that for each person, it's different. One of the biggest parts about the transitioning journey 
for me was having to accept that it's my journey. Um, and while there's a collectiveness, there's also an individual part that each person's transgender, each person's journey and how they decide or don't decide to transition and how they experience their identity is their own. Um, and that was very empowering for me. And I've had to kind of um, reaffirm that for how I'm experiencing everything that's happening politically and in my community is that how I'm going to manage it and how I need to cope with it might be different and is different in some ways from a friend of mine who's also trans. And I mean, that's hard to hold on to for me. Um, because with the advocacy and the volunteer work, there's a lot. I find myself in a position of being asked a lot of questions for, well, what does this mean for you? Well, how can we support this? Well, how am I supposed to vote politically? Well, how can I better be an advocate? How can we better be an affirming community? And I realize that I'm already exhausted emotionally. Um, and I needed to take a step back from having to be the focus of answering questions from people that are trying to be helpful for the community, but yet I don't have that energy um, because the energy is coming into trying to support and, and care for myself. And I guess a term that I would say is I don't have the energy to be the support for people who are allies in an education type role. I'm not able to be in an education role at this time in the same way that I was under the administration. Um, if I'm so, I realized I needed to take a step back and also set up that boundary for myself in order to care for myself to still be able to engage in the advocacy and volunteerism that I do in the community um, and helping to create more affirming spaces for the trans community where I live. Amen. Alex, you look like you had a response to that. Am I imagining things? Alex, I thought I saw your mic well, go. I suppose. Um, I really appreciated everything you just said, Chris. Um, and I think it speaks to that. And, and also Jalen bringing through that question of the ongoing support and what does that look like so that when a crisis like this happens, we aren't turning to the people who are most impacted in our lives saying, how, what can I do better? How can I help make sure this doesn't happen again? Like this is work that needs to be happening all the time. Um, again, in the sense of collective care all the time, as opposed to just when tragedies strike or horrible events happen in our lives. Um, and, and that's a question that uh, within trust, we've been really grappling with for the last week is there's so much need. There's need um, that, you know, Chris was speaking to of trans leaders 
being in a position of feeling like we need care and we have very particular needs around that, but also being in a position of needing to also be able to provide care, both to trans folk and for some of us also to cis folk, especially folks who are working in congregations, which is a really, really hard place to be in. And so we started asking ourselves what sort of things would be useful and helpful and what's, what's our imagining of how the UU community as a whole can take action right now and moving forward in an ongoing way to be there for trans people in our movement, both professional and lay. Um, and we've actually come up with five really clear asks. So I'd be happy to share those. <laughs> We're about to put out a statement, but please you share. Can hear it here first, y'all. <laughs> this is breaking news. Um, and and you know we we share these asks uh, in you know out of sort of representing uh, the fullness of trans community within Unitarian Universalism, not just those of us who are you know professional trans folk um, or living a call to ministry um, within our faith. But the, the five asks are um, based in what I said earlier around being able to recognize that trans you use exist, <laughs> first and foremost, <laughs> that our efforts for care really need to be both external facing and also internal facing as a movement. Um, so the first ask is to give money. Um, we're about to launch a, a, a crowdfunding campaign uh, of trust to try to be able to raise some money to be able to grant small uh, rapid response grants to trans Unitarian Universalists in need. And we specifically want to be able to prioritize uh, trans folks of color, trans women and trans feminine folks, disabled trans folks and trans youth and elders in our movement. Um, and we need help to be able to meet those needs because that's the first and foremost thing that's coming forward is um, I, I, I can't make it. <laughs> I'm not making it financially. And also I have particular needs in order to uh, stay alive um, in terms of staying housed, in terms of staying in seminary, um, especially at this moment because my own personal uh, spiritual and emotional and physical needs are being taxed by this moment. So um, giving money is a really big way that folks can actively help our people. Um, and we're basically saying, you know, if you've already made a donation to a trans organization, that's so great, we're so glad, please match that donation um, and give to this fund to support our people. So that's ask number one. Ask number two, I'm really excited about this. We have been wanting to do this for a long time, but we finally have a fire under us to start a team of accomplices, a team of people of all genders within Unitarian Universalism who are willing, able, and prepared to be active allies and accomplices for trans people in our movement. Um, and we, we're gonna have a form that launches that you can fill out and say, this is how uh, this is who I am, this is the experience that I have, and these are the ways in which I'm willing to show up and actively be there. And it can be anything from sending a care package or sharing and ask for uh, funds to, you know, intervening with somebody who is making life harder for you use in our movement or actively being hateful uh, or transphobic or housing a trans person who needs to escape a transphobic housing situation. Any rain, anything in this range um, is the sorts of actions that we're imagining. So there's room for everybody on this team. Um, and please stay tuned <laughs> to the Trust website um, for details on how to join that, that team later today or tomorrow. Um, that's ask number two. And this is gonna be indirect relationship and, and coordinated by trans folk as opposed to it being you know, coordinated by non-trans folk, uh, which would be a different kind of thing entirely. Um, ask number three is to hire us. <laughs> One of the things that's real about trans communities uh, in our world in general is that the rates of poverty um, in trans communities are hugely disproportionate, hugely ramped up because of the oppression that trans folk face. And that is also true within Unitarian Universalism. We did a survey of hundreds of trans folk um, in trust and the UUA uh, teamed up to do this survey in the spring. We found that half 
of all trans Unitarian Universalists do not have enough income to meet our basic daily needs, um, which is very different than the UU movement at large, uh, can we just say. So we, we are one of the major things that you can do to help shift this in our world is to hire trans people because economic justice is one of our biggest concerns as, as a community. Um, within Unitarian Universalism, the way that Trust is hoping to be able to help facilitate this is we are looking to launch a service directory of trans folk who do work in congregations, specifically religious professional trans folk who do things like consulting, um, trainings and education work, uh, guest preaching, that sort of thing, so that you will be able to hire us um, and help that shift these numbers. Um, and we're just going to start there because that's the thing that we are able to do. Um, but think about it in general as well, in terms of your hiring practices in congregations and and also your volunteer practices. Are you expecting volunteers to you know give of their time, emotional labor, spiritual labor, um, unpaid? And how does that disproportionately impact people? who don't have the ability to, to do that work unpaid, right? So that's another good thing to think about. The fourth ask is to engage in education and transformation work as congregations. And this one's really key, right? Because you know, I was just writing up a, a workshop proposal yesterday and I was like, you know what? I'm kind of done with being like a soft sell on this kind of stuff because our people are actually dying. So it's time for us to really move forward as a movement on this and recognize the fact that LGBTQ welcome, I'm saying that with quotes for those who can't see me, has failed trans people in Unitarian Universalism. The welcoming congregation program has existed for 30 years. And yet the survey that we did this spring shows that 72% of trans UUs, active trans UUs, do not feel as though their congregation is fully inclusive of them as trans people, 72%. And those numbers go way up when you start to add in other marginalized identities. 84% um, of young adults who are trans do not feel as though their congregations are fully inclusive of them. 90% of black trans UUs feel as though they are not fully included in their congregations. These numbers, we as trans folk, we already knew this, but they're still staggering, right? In terms of our movement's commitment to being a home for trans people, not just saying trans people have inherent worth and dignity, but being a place where we can get our spiritual needs met, because that's really different. It, and as, as someone uh, I'm in relationship with recently said, it's really different to say, we don't hate you versus we are actively here for you and we actively have you have a home here in this religion you can get your spiritual needs met here um so it's going to take a lot more than just trans 101s and the traditional educational model of this work to change these numbers um and i'm happy to say that there are some really great resources out there that can help with this one of them is an online course that the Transforming Hearts Collective recently released. It's led by me and Reverend Michael Slack. We really encourage you to check that out. It's called Trans Inclusion in Congregations. And you can find out more about it on our website, transformingheartscollective.org. Um, oh, yeah. And there's other ways that you can do this work as well. Pause, That's it, just one. pause yes, it one second. Jessica, will you promote that website on the Facebook page? Great. So you can look for that website. Look for that. And oh, that'll yeah. be in the, the statement that yeah. goes out as well that you can yeah. look for from trust. So Sorry please to take you this out. seriously. No, that's fine. Take the, take the need to do this work differently, seriously, in terms of congregational work for those of you who are in congregations, physical congregations, other than the Church of the Larger Fellowship, um, recognizing that there's still things the Church of the Larger Fellowship can do too. Uh, <laughs> whenever we gather, we have a chance to do this work. And the final ask is related to that. It's about taking your next move as a congregation or a, a community, um, a UU community to increase trans access, inclusion, and affirmation. Talk to other folks in your congregation or your group to find out what your next move is. Um, you know, for example, do, do you have at least one gender neutral bathroom? That's basic access. Do you offer our, our whole lives for all ages? All ages, all ages, not just teenagers. 
Uh, do you know, are there particular people in your congregation who are causing harm and need to be intervened with? This is a really big one because often it's just one person that makes a difference in terms of whether a trans person can be in that space and feel safe. And we have to actually, you know, be able to, to take action to, to make sure that that person's behavior is accountable. Um, is there anti-trans legislation in your state that needs to be stopped? Are you in relationship with local LGBTQ organizations? These sorts of questions are really important ones to be asking to figure out what is your next move? How can you continually be taking that next move? Um, so sorry for talking for so long, <laughs> but those are the five asks that you'll be able to hear more about from Trust if you check that out on our website as soon as that statement goes live. Um, and I really hope folks will take it seriously and take action on all five of these if possible, um, but at least several of these as a movement. I'll just lift up that Gary Simpson, who's writing this morning, writes, I'm deeply concerned by the reported poverty rates among UU trans people and the statistics about trans people not feeling well included and welcome is also a concern to me. Glad Thank to you hear your that, concern, Gary. Gary. And Alex just gave you some steps you can take your concern. Thanks so much for that. And thanks to Trust. And I just want to say, Trust is a volunteer organization, as far as I know. Is that true? Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> yes. So when you're talking about um, expecting unpaid labor by, by a marginalized group, this is an example of that happening in our midst. So I want to reiterate what Alex led with, which is to give money to Trust, uh, that these are people working hard on behalf of all of us. And um, this is my commitment. I will go and give money to trust today. And I'm also really excited to hear about your auxiliary group, whatever you're gonna call it. I, I think that's good news for us and for the movement. So that's exciting. Other responses to all that Alex just shared? Well, I'll say this, this is Michael. Um, it's exciting to me too, because I think one of the things I, I'm hearing again and again is who does the the unpaid emotional labor and who does uh, the professional labor. Um, and it really needs to be those of us who consider ourselves cisgender allies doing the unpaid emotional labor <laughs> and uh, hiring our, our transgender colleagues um, to do the paid professional parts of this. And I just, I think that that was so clear. It, it was clear in what you said, Alex. It was clear in what you said, Chris, in terms of you know, feeling like even your allies are asking you to do work um, for them. And that's, uh, so, so I think part of my job becomes how do I make people into the allies who do that unpaid emotional labor? And then how do I funnel what few funds we have to people who, who really need it the most? Um, consider my donation coming as well. <laughs> well, and I, I feel like I've learned so much on this call that I need all of your Venmos or PayPal's like individually <laughs> so that I can pay you all individually for all this work that you have done and um, the learning that I have got from this. And I think Jessica would share those with other people too. I think that is one really exciting movement that's going on where we can support individual. I support some people just because I learned so much from their Facebook posts, you know, people of color. I feel like uh, you don't know me and yet every day I'm learning from you, I should give you some money for this. And so I love the kind of currency of being able to find each other that social media with all of its disadvantages, that is, that is one moment that we have here. Um, other responses to trust or to Alex? Yeah, Don. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I've been an Alex fan for a while. Um, um, Alex has all the energy I used to have when I was younger <laughs> and is way more organized than I ever is was. Is that where it went? I've been That's where it went. Alex, and Alex is making much better use of it than I ever did. Thank God. Um, <laughs> but um, when we're talking about hiring trans people to do the paid professional work, I think it's also... Um, important to remember that trans people have other skills than being trans. And so hiring trans people to do work on systems theory and hiring trans people to do work on um, board structure stuff and hiring trans people to do things on 
you know, emergency preparedness in your congregation. Um, we do more than just, uh, and this is the XX and the XY and the XXY and the XY. You know, we, we have other skills. I mean, yes, it's nice to get paid for being trans, but, um, but we have other skills that we can do too. And we'd like to get paid for those. And I think very often when people think, oh, we need to do gender work, let's hire the trans person. But we need to do, um, we need to, to learn how to do a capital campaign um, and, and people tend to hire people that make them comfortable. And that is often very closely affiliated with the demographic of the people who are choosing. And so trans people know how to raise funds and trans people know how to do a lot of other things besides just tell people about being trans. So I think that needs to be said as well. Thanks, Don. And I heard that earlier in Alex's comment from the friend who said, where were these people when I was sick, right? That the trans, uh, that any of us doesn't want to only be reached. I, you know, when people only reach out to me when, when they're thinking about old lesbians or something, it's like, well, that's a part of who I am, but I, I'm a gardener and I'm all, the, everybody, we all have such complex identities. And so I think in an ideal world, we're all seeing each other in three-dimensional ways and interacting in, in multi-dimensional lives. And, um, it is, it is a feature of a show like this that we invite people on for particular segments of who they are too. And that's why I'm happy, Jalen and Dawn, that you're here as hosts. And I hope you'll come back, keep coming back as hosts because we're, we're all, you know, we're all complicated people. We have some people writing in. Um, here's Emily Cherry, who appears to work at the UUA as an openly trans person who's thanking everybody here and saying uh, one basic way congregations can be better is by getting preferred pronouns right and having pronouns on all name tags. These are basic changes that make a significant difference. Does everybody agree with that? Because I've actually heard other people say not to put them on everyone's name tag. <laughs> I, I mean, in the world that we inhabit because it makes some people who don't want to come out need to come out and stuff. Do you all like going to congregations where all the people have pronouns on their name tags? I'm curious about that. I personally think it's um, when it's optional um, and when there's an option presented, then that's great um, because you may not feel like coming out. Um, and also when people specifically approach me and say, I want to know your pronouns and they haven't asked anyone else around me <laughs> the same thing, right? There's a, there's a certain amount of um, objectifying me as a trans person. So I think a little more intention and care around how that's done is, is needed. Yeah, where I am, it's mostly uh, the cisgender folks who put our pronouns on our name tags, and it's it's a it's a way of signaling that we're thinking about pronouns, so that if you tell me what pronoun you use, I will use the one that you tell me you use, um, and it's not it's not a way of forcing people to come out. Um, so you know that's sort of the way that I look at it here, and uh, it's certainly it's it's certainly optional. Uh. I have a fantasy that um, UU congregations would all get on the app for gender neutral bathrooms. And especially I've been thinking about the travel dates coming up around Thanksgiving and how frightening it is to travel um, as trans people or with trans people around bathrooms. And I I'm serving part-time this tiny little suburban congregation that I just have thought there is a gender neutral bathroom there. Couldn't we let people know that so that they could find it? And then of course it get people circling, well, then someone would have to be here all the time. And you know, it gets complicated. I know that, but I do feel like um, signaling concrete support um, for people with kind of needs don't get any more concrete than needing to go to the bathroom. Um, that you know, I have thought, well, what if we thought of this as a form of sanctuary as many of our churches are thinking about and really uh, thought about providing sanctuary for travelers. That's just a little little fantasy I'm working on this little suburban congregation that I'm in, but yeah. And is that the, the Refuge app that you mean or are there others? The one, the one I know of is called Refuge. It's, it's a, a gender neutral bathroom locator. Do you know of others, Meg? 
that is the one that I that I've used there. I don't know if there there may well be others. I don't know. But, um, so we just have a couple of minutes. We're coming to the top of the hour. Anything that anybody didn't get to say or closing words from anyone? Well, then I will. I'll just say, you know, first of all, how much I appreciate people coming here at such a vulnerable time on this show. That is, it is a very generous thing to do, to, um, to be present in a time when, when, as several of you have said, you, you would like to be kind of on by yourself and, and um, left alone. So I really want to lift up great gratitude and appreciation for, for today's hosts and panelists. I also really wanna lift up the email that Alex has said is coming out from Trust and that if you're not gonna get that as an email to go to the Trust website and find it and not just find it, but share it, share it with your congregation if you're part of a congregation. If you are a lay person, send it to your pro religious professionals and say, I wanna meet with you and talk to you about what we're gonna do about these five action items in this congregation. Um, and um, it's a starting place. And also to everybody who has the ability to give money to trust to a, um, I, uh, I, for me, it's the transgender youth movement that I've really felt the most um, terror about. Uh, having a 22 year old and seeing what those teenage years are like firsthand, I feel like, yeah, that's, that's where my money went immediately. But also, um, I just, yeah, I just really want to lift up gratitude. This has been, I will listen to the show again because I've only gotten about a 10th of it. There was so much wisdom shared here. So thank you very much. I can't remember. I don't think, well, I'm sorry that we're so week by week with topics right now. It does feel like something happens every week and we're just trying to keep up with it. But um, we, we do have some good guests coming along. <laughs> I know. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, it's just the way it is. It's a way of life. And thanks so much to our guest hosts. I hope you'll come back and guest host again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And bless you all. Yes, absolutely. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. I appreciate it.